If you permitted your Bibles to follow you into the sanctuary, please take it and stand with me as we read from the Word of God. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And I will read in your hearing verses 25 and 26. Mark chapter 5. And I'll read in your hearing verses 25 and 26. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And the Bible says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had, yet instead of growing better, she grew worse. Bow your heads with me as we consider the subject, Take Me to the King. Take Me to the King. Father in heaven, we thank you for just the opportunity to be alive this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence and to be recognized by other people. Lord, we, we thank you for keeping us safe from all hurt, harm, or danger. If, the, if our eyes could be opened and the curtain could be pulled back, we could see the hand of protection that is over our life every moment of every day of our lives. We ask that you be with the people who are hurting right now for whatever reason, whatever situation they find themselves in. We ask that you meet them at the point of their need and do it in a way that only you can do. We ask that you be with our time today. In your name we do pray, amen. Global positioning systems, known to most of the world as GPS, are invaluable technical innovations. They're, they're fascinating inventions. Hear me, especially if you're riding with a man. Now a man, maybe it's just me, will try to get to his destination by memory without a gas break, without a water break, without a stretch break, a bathroom break, while listening to the same album on repeat with no stopping to take pictures. Now a woman will print out a map, highlight the streets on the map, pre-program the GPS, charge the GPS and make sure all of the software is updated inside of the GPS and we want to stop at every single vista to take a picture. All the while the GPS is recalculating after every stop. Like I said, they're, they're, they're amazing technological inventions. They're designed to get you from point A to point B. They give you directions, instructions, and guidance if you're driving, flying, riding, walking, or whatever mode of transportation you might be using. They're helpful for people who are on journeys, people who have a desired destination already in place. Now, before my time, before GPS existed, we had road maps where you would have to identify your desired destination on that map and then set out on a journey to that place. I imagine before any one of us were born, before maps, there were people who used the stars for longitude and latitude by calibrating their location to the North Star. This is assuming that one person knows where they are at any given time. In order to go to point B, you have to be cognizant of point A. The global positioning system is a space-based satellite navigation system that provides a location and time in all weather conditions, anywhere or near planet Earth, where there's an, an unobstructed view or line of sight between four or more GPS satellites. Knowing where you are is the first step. Knowing where you are is spiritual kindergarten. I know I'm in point A, but I need to get to point B. And for most people, point B is a temporary place. We put in our GPS when we're going somewhere temporary, a vacation or a tourist spot. But what do you do when getting to point B is a matter of death or life? In Mark chapter 5, we have Dr. Jesus. He's traveling around Palestine making house calls. The kingdom of heaven is under health care reform, health not just for the body but of the soul. Dr. Jesus is making salvation affordable to all. After his website crashes, after John the Baptist comes on the scene, Dr. Jesus goes out to make house calls, hold seminars, and to hold press conferences and interviews to explain this new form of health care. People on the left, they try to confuse him. 
People on the right, they try to abuse him. And people in the middle, they try to misuse him. But Jesus wants to make salvation affordable to all. Dr. Jesus, he turns on his GPS. And he starts from Nazareth and he goes to Jordan to be baptized. Then he leaves there to go into the wilderness. Then he goes to Capernaum. And then the record says he goes anywhere and everywhere in the name of the Father. And everywhere he goes, his GPS is always connected to his father. In today's story, Jesus starts on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and he travels eight miles across, and he encounters a storm. And the disciples think that the GPS will go out in a storm, but Jesus stays connected. They get to the cemetery, and the disciples think that his GPS won't get reception in such a remote place. But Jesus stays connected. After all, who needs reception in a cemetery? He comes back across the sea and is swamped by a crowd, and they carry him this way and that way. He can barely get a breath, but Jesus stays connected. The GPS inside of his divinity stays connected in, in a storm, stays connected in winds and waves, and he gets reception in the cemetery. Surely God has that supernatural 4G connection where he can see and stay connected to his son no matter where he goes. Along the way, we see this certain woman. She wishes she had any type of a connection. She has no direction, no reception, no bars connecting her to anything. She has no point B. She has no point C. And she is stuck in point A for 12 years. It says she is a woman and she's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She has suffered while in point A. She's been given false hope while in this place. Empty promises returned to her void. She won't be denied access to treatment, but why seek treatment when I'm used to bleeding? I have been living this long with the same condition. Why do I need to change? And I've learned a few things why people stay in bad situations. Number one, the situation that they're in becomes normal. She, comes, she becomes accustomed to bleeding. She wakes up every day. She faces her condition. And after 12 years of bleeding, the patterns in her basal ganglia have etched those neural pathways. And it becomes normal. She has settled into a pattern of bleeding, and her bleeding becomes normal. Her bleeding becomes chronic. Some people stay in bad and abusive situations because it becomes normal after a while. The second reason why people stay in bleeding situations is simply they don't know where to go. So many people stay in point A because they don't have goals to aspire to. All they know is what they know. It's not that they don't want to do better. They, they, they don't know where to go in order to get better. If this woman who's anonymous, if she had a Facebook page, she could go on and ask all of her friends, where do I go for help? She could ask Siri where to go. She could Google where to go. She could ask Yahoo where to go. Some people just don't know where to go. And since I know that, I'll do a few things. The first thing I, I'll do is I won't tell people of places I've never been. I won't tell people of places without providing them transport to get there. And if transportation cannot be provided to point B, then I will bring point B to them. What, what, what are you saying, preacher? If I live in a foster home and I don't know what to do after high school, instead of passing out flyers and pamphlets to distant colleges I cannot afford, I will show you some places I've been, hear me, in my car. And if I can't do that, then I will bring a recruiter to you. And I won't just give you an application. I will fill it out with you. I will look at classes with you. I will show you how to highlight your book. I will show you how to take notes and study for an exam. Don't assume that I don't want better just because I don't know better. Hear me, so if you live in a nursing home, and you can't drive, how about I come to you and take you to a beach that I've been to, that I know you'll enjoy. And if you're too fatigued to make it to the beach, 
I will go to the beach in person and I'll take my iPad and I'll shoot some videos and I'll bring them back to you. Not only will I bring a video back to you, I'll bring some sand from the beach and some stones from the beach and some seashells from the beach and I'll bring some candles that smell like seaweed. Don't just assume that I don't like it just because I'm stuck in a nursing home. Just because people don't know where to go doesn't mean they don't have aspirations to be better. Another reason why people don't leave is because they have fear of retaliation. Some people are in situations where if they leave, they fear physical harm will come to them. It's like people who are smuggled into certain locations with promises of a better life, promises of a better job, promises of a better future, and they come to this new place, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, and the people who bring them take their passport, and they charge them a fee, and they have no support system, and they find themselves stuck on Law and Order Special Victims Unit, and if they leave, they fear retaliation. This woman bleeds every day for 12 years, and she finds herself stuck. She bled. She is bleeding, and the record says she will continue to bleed. And what comes to my mind is the natural and logical question is, what happens when I bleed every day? When a person bleeds, that means that their blood is escaping their circulatory system. When a person bleeds, they can bleed internally and externally. Maybe she is tachycardic, meaning that she, has, she is suffering from a change in heart rate or lowered blood pressure. If she bleeds every day, her skin will, will have discoloration because of poor circulation. If she bleeds every day for 12 years, she will be dizzy, she will be faint, she'll be nauseated and very thirsty. She will go through various stages of shock due to blood loss. And I've learned that a person can bleed externally, but if they're bleeding on the inside, they can have damage that nobody can see. Internal bleeding is, 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 is hard because you cannot see it and it's hard to diagnose. I have more internal bleeding than I do external bleeding and I'm just like this woman. Sometimes I bleed alone. Sometimes I bleed in public. And I imagine after 12 years, I would just get used to bleeding in a never-ending Groundhog Day, and it would just become normal. You see, the more we try to deny the pain, the more we try to numb the pain and cover up the pain, the louder it gets, and the deeper in pain we go. We try alcohol. We try retail therapy. We try pornography. We try weed, and it might make us fall asleep. But the next morning, we still wake up bleeding. Nothing improves and nothing changes. We're stuck, and we want something better for our lives. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of putting on gauze. I'm tired of putting on ointments. I'm tired of putting Band-Aids on my bleeding. I try to make it to stop. You've taken me to the gurus. You've taken me to the psychics. You've taken me to the strip clubs, but I still bleed. You've taken me to the doctor. You've taken me to the church. But I need somebody to take me to the king. And you show up to take me to the king, but the pain dies down. And I get a handle on it again. I come out of the withdrawals. The hangover dies down, and I get used to my bleeding again. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 was, was right when he asks, Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more your whole head is sick and your whole heart is faint from the sole of your foot to the top of your head there is no soundness in it but what do you do when you get used to bleeding hear me though knowing that your bleeding is not enough they, they tell me that humpty dumpty sat on the wall they told me that Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. They say that all of the king's horses and all of the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, don't ask me how a horse can try to put together an egg. I do not know. But if Humpty is like me, 
He'll try to get up and bandage himself together. He'll try to put the shell back together. He'll get some duct tape and try to wrap it around his broken shell. And after a while, maybe he can manage to live with the pain. Maybe he can get some coding and other painkillers to numb it. And he can order his life around his new normal. You see, that's the reason why men don't go to the doctor. It's because we learn how to live with pain. The issue is not if we're in pain. The issue is it doesn't hurt enough. You see, when the light comes on in your car, well, my car, we ignore it until we get used to it. It's not that we don't know that we're bleeding. The problem is that we've gotten used to it and we've learned how to manage it. It says in verse 25 that she suffers a great deal under the care of many doctors and she spends everything that she has and instead of growing better she grows worse here are the critical questions have you spent everything and has it gotten worse before you can change and go to point b you have to make a decision that you're not going to stay where you are that will not happen until you spend everything that you have and things in your life get worse. You see, the first step towards change, the first step towards getting anywhere is to decide that you're not going to stay where you are. You have to make an internal decision that you will not remain at point A. You have to make a choice inside of your spirit, inside of your mind, inside of your soul, that you want to stop bleeding. You have to make a resolution in your spirit that you want something different than waking up every day to the same condition. She has so many obstacles in her way. She has so many excuses. She has obstacles of position because she is a woman. She has obstacles of predicament. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She tries doctors. She tries the church. She is what my grandmama used to say. She is broke, busted, and disgusted. She is sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's the point. A person will not come to the place where they decide that they no longer want to stay where they are until they spend everything that they have and their condition that they're in and trying to manage, it actually gets worse. You see, when it is that you spend everything that you have and things get worse in your life, you decide real quick that you want something different. When things get real tight in your life, you decide real quick that you want something different. Even Batman knows that. What are you talking about? Batman knows that. You see, in The Dark Knight Rises, Batman hadn't been seen in months. He saves Gotham from the Joker in, in part two. He loses his love interest, Rachel, in an explosion to save Harvey Dent. Bruce Wayne can only see himself as Batman, and when he cannot save Rachel, he is stuck in his own grief. He stops eating and bathing, and he doesn't even leave his home. People haven't seen Bruce Wayne in months. Because of his grief, he gets stuck. He gets stuck in grief. He stops living. He loses the will to become Gotham's hero. But you see, Gotham is taken over by a new villain. And this new villain, his name is Bane. And when Bane meets Batman, he says, darkness is your ally. You adopted the dark but I was born in it. I was molded by it. I was, I was shaped by it. I was trained in the League of Shadows. And when he begins to fight Batman, Bane, hear me, turns into a psychologist. He says, I want to know which will break first, your spirit or your body. And Batman says, why don't you just kill me? And Bane says, you don't fear death, you welcome it. You need a punishment more severe not of your body, but of your soul. Maybe Bain knows the Bible where it says in Proverbs 18 verse 14 that the human spirit can endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear. He wants to crush Batman's spirit. He beats Batman up and Batman thinks he's going to die, but he throws 
Batman into a cave with a broken body and a breaking spirit. He is locked in a prison of stone, but his spirit is locked in solitary confinement. He weeps in tears as Gotham is destroyed. And most people assume that Batman will rot in this prison and die, but he finally reaches rock bottom. He finally comes to the end of his rope, but hear me, he cannot get off that cot and start exercising and doing pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups. He has to make a decision where he's not going to stay where he is before he can rise out of the prison. He has to make a decision that he does not want to stay in misery. You see, it's when Samson is blind and is in chains and is grinding corn that he makes a decision that he wants something different for his life. It's when Solomon tries wisdom and tries woman after woman after woman and he tries money and fame and everything that life can afford him. It's when none of that satisfies him that he makes a decision that there has to be something better than this. It's when the prodigal son leaves home and spends everything that he has. He loses his money and falls into a famine. And he goes rolling with swine that he finally comes to himself. And he thinks that there has to be something better than where I am. You have to spend everything that you have and things in your life have to get worse. Before you finally make a decision that you do not want to remain where you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want something better for my life. I want something better for my life. That's the wrong neighbor. Turn to the other one and say, I do not want to stay where I am. I do not want to stay where I am. You see this woman, she is searching. She tries everything that she can think of. She tries the law, but nothing changes. She tries the church, but nothing changes. Her explanations do not explain. Her solutions do not solve. Her answers do not answer. And she spends everything that she has. And instead of getting better, things get worse. And it's when things get worse, she makes a decision that she's not going to stay where she is. The next thing I stop by to tell you is, not only do you have to make a decision that you're not going to stay where you are, hear me, you have to make a decision to leave. And it usually doesn't happen until you spend everything and the place that you find yourself is more toxic than point B. I told you a couple of weeks ago that I don't pray for people for things in their life to get better. When people come to me asking for peace and for respite and for solace, if I see spiritual pain in their life, I pray for their need, but in my private time, I ask God to bring chaos to their lives. I don't pray for things to get better. I pray for things to get worse. I want some people, not everybody, I want some people to be so dissatisfied, so restless, so uncomfortable, where they desire something better for their lives. For people who drink, I pray that they cannot get drunk. For people who smoke weed, I pray that they cannot get high. For people who shoot up, I pray that that fix will not come until the reality of the situation is clear. That they hit rock bottom and they make a decision that they do not want to stay where they are. And that decision gives them courage to make another decision to leave. She has to make a decision to leave. Hosea chapter 2 verse 7 says in the Message Bible, she will go on the hunt for her lovers, but she will not bring down a single one. She will look high and low, but won't find a one. And she'll finally say to herself, I am going back to my first husband, the one I started out with. There was a better life with him than the one I have now. I need to tell you something very critical. When you make a decision to change, 
when you make a decision to leave where you are, you need to understand something very simple. It's a decision. You're looking at me the same way I thought about it. It's a decision. Your situation does not have to change for life, have to, for life to happen inside of you. Nothing may actually change around you, but your decision to change has. What are you talking about, preacher? All right. Let's say I'm on the block. Let's say I'm on the block. I'm getting high. I'm drinking Coke 45 malt liquor. And I'm, and I'm around my boys, and I'm there every day for 12 years. We do the same thing. We, we get high, we, we drink malt liquor, and we go home, watch late-night TV shows. And I wake up one day, and I come back to the block, and I think, there has to be something better than this. I make a decision for something to be different, but I'm still on the block. And people that I roll with, they will look at me, and they will judge me, and they'll say, nothing has changed on the outside but I have made a decision on the inside, all right? Let's say I fell out of school, and I go back to living with my mother, and, and I go back to being unemployed, and I go back to sleeping on a twin mattress with cartoon blankets. They're doing nothing. And a commercial of Oakwood comes up on the screen, and I make a decision that I wanna go to college. And I'm there by myself, and nobody can celebrate my decision with me. And I run downstairs telling everybody I'm going to college. And they look at me crazy, but I made a decision. A decision for change always comes before the change. Let me say that again. A decision for change always comes before the change. Nothing may happen on the outside of you, but a decision has been made on the inside of you. You yearn for a better life, a better path. It's not abracadabra. Things don't magically and instantaneously change. You have to make a decision to change. You make a decision that you do not want to stay where you are, and you make a decision to leave where you are. You see, the first part is easier than the second. The first part is easier. But you see, one of the biggest problems that humans being, human beings have is the problem that Eve had when she was at the tree. You see, when Eve was there talking with the snake, or better yet, the snake was talking to her, hear me, I slipped by it one day, she could have just turned around and left. She wasn't obligated to engage in dialogue with the snake. She could have called a timeout. She could, have just, she could have just left the tree. She did not have to finish the conversation. What are you saying, preacher? When you make a decision to change, when you make a decision to leave, you do not need the devil's permission. You do not, when you make a decision to change your life, he's like a pimp. He'll disagree with you, but you do not need his authorization to leave. You don't need to have a discussion with him. You don't have to have a negotiation with him. You can tell him to call Tyrone, come get your stuff, and if you won't leave, I'll file an eviction notice. You do not need his permission to kick him out of your life, and if he won't leave, just turn around and walk away. You see, you know all of the ways that they say are bad ways to break up with somebody? All right. You don't text somebody breaking up with them. You don't email somebody breaking up with them. You don't unfriend them on Facebook. You don't block them. You don't do the houdini thing where you just disappear. Those are bad ways of breaking up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. But they are all acceptable ways to break up with the devil. You don't have to run it buy him before you end it. You can unfriend him, block him, and just bounce. It's not up for conversation. You don't need to deliberate with him. You don't have to negotiate with him. You don't have to come to terms of a settlement. If you want to go, just say, I'll holler at you when I see you in the street. I'm out. Don't call me. Don't text me. Don't poke me. Don't contact me on my birthday. Don't hit me up saying I was just thinking about you and I just wanted to see how you was doing. You go your way and let me go my way. You see, your breakthrough does not come when you get to your change. 
Your breakthrough comes when you make a decision to change. He's not going to agree with your decision anyway, so why do you need his permission? If you really want to talk about it. Okay, before you sit down, devil, there's something I need to explain. Since, since you're here, I think I should tell you that, that things have changed since the last time we talked. I'm tired of being brokenhearted. I made a list of all of the things you did to me and your own and all of my hopes and my dreams, those things you took from me. I want those back before you leave. And when you leave, I'll never trust you again. My heart refuses to be your slave. I'm no longer your prisoner. Today, I remember that apart from you is where I belong. And since I don't do long breakups, I'll just say farewell. I don't need your permission, so I'll just say goodbye. I don't need to have a conversation with you, so I'll just say so long. I'm making a decision to leave. No, we can't talk about it. No, we can't work it out. It's not going to be a complicated engagement. There's not going to be a separation. We're not going to have no counseling. There's no friends with benefits. We're not going to just kick it. When I make a decision to leave, Nick, bro, you need to leave. I make a decision that I'm not going to stay where I am and I make a decision to leave. But where am I going to go? The record says she heard reports concerning Jesus and she made another decision. She made another decision that she's now going to go in the right direction. And when she goes in the right direction, she encounters obstacles. She encounters a crowd. Hear me, she is still bleeding. But every time she reaches a detour, she tells her body, take me to the king. Don't take me back home. Don't take me to the hospital. Don't take me to an urgent care clinic. Don't take me to the temple. Don't take me to the sanctuary. Take me to the king. The devil whispers in her ear that you should just turn around, but she keeps saying to herself, if I just touch the hem of his garment, that's just another way of saying, take me to the king. I shall be made well if I get to him. I've tried medicine, I've tried sacrifice, I've tried home remedies. Please take me to the king. I need an audience with the master. Where I am is too bad, I'm tired of living this life. Any place where I am is better than this. I might have to press to the king. I might have to bleed going to the king. But when I make it to him, all of the people who see me in the process, they'll say, woman, you're still bleeding, but at least I'm on the way. Take me to the king. I'll just tell them, please don't block me from him. Take me to him. I've tried your way. I've tried their way. Let me get to him and try his way. You might look at me and I'm still bleeding, but at least I'm going in the right direction. I heard things about this king. I heard that things will change when I touch the right person. I've been touching doctors. I've been touching lambs. I've been touching priests. I need to touch somebody else. You see, things change when you connect to the right person. You see, you can leave where you are and go in the right direction, but unless you connect with the right person, you will continue to bleed. When Jesus connects with the right people, leprosy falls off. When Jesus connects with the right people, blind eyes are open and withered hands are made straight and demons stutter, shudder when they run for cover. Things change when you touch the right person. You see, she touched doctors before. She touched priests before. She was touched by nurses and pastors before. But they were not the king. When I make it to this king, I realize that he was there the first time I was bleeding. He was there the first time I was diagnosed with an internal hemorrhage. He was there every doctor's appointment when I swiped my debit card and I was spending everything that I had. He was there all along, and the strength that I thought was carrying me, I come to find out, he was carrying me all along. When I made a decision that I did not want to stay where I was, and when I made a decision to leave, that was him giving me the power to make a decision. I did not want to stay where I was. 
I was stuck in a groundhog day of bleeding, but this king showed up and he gave me the power of choice. He was the one who gave me another choice. His GPS connected to mine and told me that I was lost. His GPS connected to mine and pulled me towards him. Even though the crowd blocked me, even though the crowd tried to stop me, the GPS inside the king was pulling me towards his palace and it would not let me go. So please don't block me. Please don't distract me. Please don't disturb me. If you cannot help me make it to the king, then please get out of my way. Even if you don't agree with my decision, just because you're stuck on bleeding does not mean I have to stay where I am. If you can't take me to him, please get out of my way. You may not agree with my decision because you're used to bleeding. But I want something different for my life. I don't know about you. Hear me. There's something in your life that you want to change. There's something in your life that you want to be different, and you want to make a decision right now, right here, that you do not want to remain where you are. I invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray a special prayer just for you. You want something in your life to change. I invite you to make a decision right now that you will not remain where you are. No matter what it is, you're making a decision now that you will not stay where you are. You're tired of being at point A. And you want to go to point B, to a better place, to the promised place. But you have to make a decision here and now that you're not going to stay where you are. Hear me. The second thing you need to do is make a decision to leave. Make a decision right now that you're going to leave whoever it is, whatever it is, wherever it is. Make a decision right now. You can tweet them later. You can Facebook them later. You can text them later. But make a decision now that you're going to leave. Bow your heads with me. There's somebody here under the sound of my voice. You find yourself stuck in a situation and you're tired of doing the same thing every single day and you want the power to leave. Hear me, that power will never be stronger than right now. Somebody here under the sound of my voice has made a decision to leave something in their life. I invite you to come to the front. I'm gonna pray a special prayer of consecration just for you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. There's somebody here under the sound of my voice, you've made a decision that you do not want to stay where you are. That courage to make that decision will never be stronger than it is right now. You want to leave, I invite you to come to the front. I'm going to pray a special prayer of consecration just for you. There's something you want to leave. It might be a person, it might be poor exercise habits, it might be the devil. Come to the front. I want to pray a special prayer of consecration just for you. You've been trying everything, but you have not tried the only thing. Come to the front. I want to pray a special prayer of consecration just for you. Father in heaven, you, you see the people here. We don't see them because our eyes are closed, but Father, you see them. You saw them when they began their thing. You saw them when it became normal. You saw them when they began to cope with the pain and tried to cover it up. But Lord, we're looking in the mirror and we see what is and we're tired of bleeding every moment of every day. Lord, there are people here that you see the decision that they've made, that they're not going to stay where they are, that they want to leave, and that they are leaving. Father, I ask that you go to whatever it is that they're separating from. Declare an eviction notice. Give that person, that thing, that it, whatever it is, give it a, a cease and desist order right now in the name of Jesus. 
Go to their place. Go to their pain. Bind it, lock it, and detach it from them right now. Father, you're the king, and you can do anything but fail. If you want God's deliverance, you want his change, just respond by saying amen. God bless you.